Today I'm here with Oliver Hartner, who is a writer for Cubby Rise, and I think by now it might be accurate to say a long time writer for Cubby Rise. How's it going today, Oliver? Going great. Uh, I'm, I appreciate that introduction, Matt. Um, it's going good. Uh, COVID is, is here and won't, won't, I'm in South Carolina, so we're kind of the COVID capital right now. <laughs> Hopefully it leaves us sooner rather than later, but we're yeah. here. How is your summer going? Are you working from home like most other people? I am. I am working from home. Uh, um, haven't really left much. Uh, made a couple day trips down to Charleston. Um, other than that, we're still here. <laughs> Just trying yeah. to stay safe. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I'm in uh, central Minnesota and luckily it hasn't hit us too bad here. We have a fair amount of cases, but I'm just trying to do our best to, to stay safe. And I, I do get out of the house sometimes and I'm trying to uh, socially distance on the trout streams and in the turkey woods as much as I, I can this spring and summer. So Yeah, I've been, I, I did a good bit of that myself. I did not get a bird this year, unfortunately, but uh, had some great hunts. Had some great hunts, heard a lot of goblins, so. Good, good. And we're here to uh, talk about your writing. And uh, oh. I appreciate your time um, with us today. You've written some articles in the past, and we're going we're gonna to talk about some specific art articles that are going to come um, down the road. But before I get into all of that, uh, for, for readers of your pieces and Cover Your Eyes that maybe want to know a little bit more about you, give us a Cliff Notes version of uh, who Oliver Kirchner is. Oh, well, okay. Um, so I was born in uh, Louisiana. I was a Louisiana native. I grew up in the Feliciana parishes, also known as the West Florida parishes, uh, because Florida Panhandle was extended all the way to the Mississippi River. So that's, that's where I grew up. Uh, and I hunted, I, um, I hunted in the, the southwest corner of Mississippi and also in those uh, Feliciana parishes. Um, in Louisiana, near the Mississippi River. Uh, river's really wide, big there, so there's a lot of little tributaries and swamps, uh, a lot of lowland areas, um, and then just to that Mississippi River Delta, that's uh, right there in the center, central flyway uh, for duck hunting. Um, my grandfather was a big waterfowler, and he gave it up right about the time I was kind of coming up and also uh, lead was, was uh, no longer uh, usable. It was no bueno <laughs> if you're shooting lead shot at ducks. Uh, so he kind of gave it up, but I went deer hunting with him a few times and that's who kind of got me interested in, in uh, being a field. I also worked on a survey crew and that was some outdoor exposure as a youngster. I started working on a land survey crew when I was about, 10 or 11 years old, um, holding the prism and the swamps around uh, St. Francisville in that area. Um, so anyway, I, I graduated high school, served in the National Guard in Louisiana, got called up to go to Iraq. And then when I got back from there, uh, I, tran I was attending university. I transferred to Ole Miss and uh, finished my work there, then moved to South Carolina. And uh, so I had a little hiatus there uh, between the between my service in Iraq and finally finishing graduate school, maybe a, almost a decade where I was not I didn't do a lot of outdoor activities really at all. I was trying to finish up my education, and then I started. I got a I got a job and started getting into the outdoors again, and and uh, picked up a issue of Covey Rise one day <laughs> and uh, was very inspired and felt like I wanted to uh, be a writer as well. Uh, so it kind of got me thinking about writing more, uh, getting my work out there. And so I started small. I started writing for free for a little local publication covering just all kinds of stuff. And then I leveraged that into into writing for another local publication, but they actually paid. <laughs> and then I leveraged that into writing for South Carolina Wildlife. And then uh, just, you know, made some connections with Covey Rise through the Southeastern Wildlife Expo. 
and um, introduced myself and stayed in touch with them. And a couple years after that, I got my first assignment. And that was, I guess, uh, two, two or three years ago. <laughs> and I uh, still, still love writing for the magazine. It's really an honor and a privilege to be writing for the magazine. And the rest is history, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We work together quite often these days, and uh, you know, you, you're. I, we appreciate your style. It, it's like you understand the mission of Cubby Rise and and the uh, the importance of celebrating our upland traditions, and that definitely comes out in the features that you write for us. Um, but I, it's interesting to me to hear how someone gets into this. Um, becoming a, an outdoor writer is not an easy thing to do. You know, like you said, you started small and, and did some work for free and kind of built up your resume to the point where where you, you are at today. But my question to you is, you know, why? What is it about writing these types of stories would would um, make you want to go through that effort? Well, you know, to it, it's uh, it, it's I'm reading Archibald Rutledge right now and he died in 1973. And here I am in 2020 reading his work. And I've read some of his stuff before, but for me, that's what writing is about. It's, uh, it's, about, leaving a, uh, it's about leaving some evidence, some, some, some form of confirmation that you were here, that you existed, that you had something to say, stories to tell. And, and other, than, other than with your immediate family, it's just, sort of uh it's like having a bigger circle around yourself um i've met a lot of great and wonderful people that i would never have met otherwise if not through my writing and it's really been an enriching uh life activity for me but that's why i do it just to leave just to leave a legacy of some kind mm -hmm. behind after i'm gone <laughs> yeah and, and I, actually i was just talking to andrew lee uh, a couple of weeks ago and oh, you good. You wrote the feature about Andrew. He's a professional artist from Auburn. And uh, we, we were talking about that, that exact same thing in, in terms of art. You know, like the idea was he, he does a painting of, of somebody's dog, for instance. And, you know, the hope is that that painting is going to be on somebody's wall. And, and the family, many, many years down the road, hopefully appreciates um, the story behind the painting and all of that. It's like a, a sense of legacy. And I feel the same way when I'm writing an article. Maybe, maybe it's, it's vain or, or, you know, lots of writers are probably like me. We hope maybe a hundred years down the road, somebody is able to pick up that magazine and read that story and kind of feel the experience that we experience now. And is that kind of the way you see it too? Absolutely. And uh, I loved writing that piece. It was it, it, it was very inspiring. He's a really inspiring guy. And it, it, he, it, he hits a nail on the head and so did you. It, and I'm not, I, you know, I, I try not to be vain uh, about it. Um, and I'm not sure if it's so, you know, there are different ways to leave a mark on, 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 uh, on society and, and people's minds that that, that you, that you were here, uh, you know, painting is one of them. Writing is another creating a piece of music is another. Uh, so, but, but yeah, that, I, I think you're right. I think that's definitely accurate. Mm -hmm. And let's jump into an article. We're going to tease out. Um, <laughs> it's a piece on, uh, on Darlington Gunworks in South Carolina. Uh yeah, and that one's coming out later this fall, but, but and I've been working on it recently, and I, I, just, I just enjoyed it a lot, and I'm excited for readers to, to read it, but I want to kind of provide readers a little more context so they can expect what, you know, the full story when they read it actually in the magazine. So um, t tell us about Darlington Gunworks, maybe just sort of set the scene behind how this idea came up in the first place. Sure. So Darlington Gunworks, I'd heard of, I'd heard legends <laughs> of this guy named Jim Kelly, who, you know, best gunsmith you'd ever meet. Ever. I said, oh, well, what kind of guns? And, they, and, and I said, 
you know, they when they started naming Wesley Richards and E.J. Churchill and Fox and 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 uh, Parker, I said, oh well, that that's interesting. That piqued my interest. And then I'm also I'm the secretary uh, for the state of South Carolina's Ducks Unlimited chapter, uh, the state level chapter. I'm the secretary, and I I saw this video uh, called Bo Whoop. And I found out that Jim Kelly was the uh, guy who fixed it up, who got it going again, who did some stock work for it. Uh, and I looked up, I saw Will Brantley of Field and Stream had written an article, and he was actually in this video that's on YouTube. And so I said, oh, my gosh. And I started, I did, I did more research, and I connected all the dots. I said, I want to talk to this guy. So I called him up and drove down to Darlington or, or drove over to Darlington. So Darlington is actually maybe, I mean, something else he was so close. I was like, Oh my gosh, this, this guy lives in Darlington, South Carolina. That's like an hour away. So I drove an hour East of here and I came up to the, I, I his business, it, it, the guns that he has there, you wouldn't look at the outside of the building and think that, such a treasure trove exists. It's very unassuming. And so, but the first thing I noticed when I went in were these, all these side-by-side -side double guns and they were angled all along the wall um, <laughs> at a 45 and they were just everywhere. And you would flip a tag and there'd be a, West, a Wesley Richards, EJ Churchill, a, a, a Fox, AH Fox, uh, Ithaca, uh, Lefebvre and uh, it was just it was it was just I was taken aback and then also his wife was there and she had a sign on the wall that said uh, it said uh, your wife just called she said to buy anything you want uh, <laughs> <laughs> so but no I had a great time visiting with Jim um, and he really is quite an extraordinary guy uh, his story, I mean, I spent, I spent hours with him. I spent most of the, I spent about at least half the day with him. Uh, just, I didn't, they were busy. I mean, they were really busy working. They had a lot of guns in there. Um, they had a WW Greener that was owned by Henry Davis, who's a pretty famous, and it was in the shop when I was there uh, for some, for some work. Um, and, and he was a, turkey hunter he's big he's big in the turkey hunting community um but he's also from south carolina and then jim launched into a story about he almost got to meet henry davis <laughs> and uh though i was not quite able to get the uh the word count in that particular story to match up you know mm -hmm. uh one of the great things about writing for cubby rise is they give you a lot of real estate as a writer uh but 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 you just can't get it all in there. And I felt like pe people would know more about Bo Whoop than they would about Henry Davis yeah. and Greener that he used. So I wanted to focus more on maybe the Bo Whoop story uh, as, part, as part of the overall piece. Yeah, yeah. And I want to talk about Bo Whoop at, at some point. Um, but first, yeah, sure. but, but first I, I've never been to the shop. Um, but after reading it, it made me, re it reminded me of like, you know, some of these shops are just gems. Some of these shops in these small towns that you go into, like you said, it's unassuming when you walk through the front door, but you go in and you just, the, the history and the, the knowledge and the skills and, the, and, and all of that that goes into it is just fascinating. And it, uh, you definitely yeah, so, get that from the story. And that, so my question was like, you know, just visiting the shop, what's, what's most unique about it in your mind? Is it that they're actually working on those guns there or what what was it for you oh gosh i think one of the most i mean just the to go back there to go back there and see what these guys are doing and spend the day with them i mean it's hard work it's dirty it's not you know to to build a gun you know jim they can they they're actual gunsmiths in the sense that they can't find a part for your gun they will build one they will fabricate one from a metal blank um and to and it it is not easy work it isn't you know they they build guns from hand they they have the 
equipment, the ability to build a gun from pretty much, pretty much nothing. And that is just so fascinating to me that you can take the raw materials of this earth and make a firearm that is so reliable and so strong that it will last, it will outlast you and then outlast your children and maybe even their children. And, and then those that were built that long ago that crossed the threshold of their shop door, they can take that gun and of all the stories and all the lives that that gun has lived, they can make it live again mm -hmm. or make it live beyond what anyone else thought it would. You know, Jim's taken, he calls them basket cases <laughs> because they come to him literally as a basket of parts <laughs> and he can make a gun live again, tell this, continue, continue, a field from that basket of parts. That's how good he is. And, and, and to have that level of skill as a gunsmith, at least in the United States, uh, I know over in Europe that that's, it's generally par for the course you, to be a, to, to have gunsmith stamped on your forehead over in Europe, you have to apprentice from the time you're a teenager until you're probably in your late twenties. And then you're a gunsmith. Um, but over here, you know, that's why Jim is such a treasure mm -hmm. and, and what he does is so, so amazing. Um, talk, talk about legacy, right? Like right. When you, whether, whether you're talking yeah. writing like we do or art yeah. or creating guns for that, that are going to be used for years to come. I mean, that's creating so guns and keeping them running. That's Jim's legacy. That's Jim's legacy. Absolutely. Absolutely. There will, there will. There will never be another Jim Kelly, though he does have apprentices and he's taught them well. Um, I tell you, it, yeah, that that was that was really amazing to me, just to see how it's done, the work. And there's a lot of work. What was most memorable about Jim himself as a person? Really? So Jim, so Jim's in his 80s, mm -hmm. uh, but he doesn't really look it. <laughs> <laughs> so and maybe that's because he gets to do what he loves every day but that was one of the most memorable things and he he's always got a cigar between his teeth like an old Clint Eastwood style cigar not a not a nice uh you know uh partagus you know not anything Chuck Holland would probably have uh, <laughs> but but an old Clint Eastwood you know probably could put it out and put as a plug of chew in his mouth if he wanted kind of thing, yeah. but he smoked it constantly. It was all day <laughs> and he's 80 and he's, you know, he's in his mid eighties. That's funny. So that was kind of fun. But like I said, he doesn't look, he, he you know, he probably looks like he's in his sixties or seventies maybe, but he just doesn't look like a man in his mid eighties to yeah. me. Yeah. That's interesting. So, yeah. so, so back to Bo Whoop then I've, I've heard about that story before, but I, I really enjoyed you providing some more detail um, about it and, and applying that specifically to the Darlington shop. Um, so don't give away everything, but maybe maybe just tell a little more context about, about how that all applies and how it all works together. Sure. So um, Jim, Jim was in his shop one day and there's a guy that walks in there with a with an AH Super Fox, which is a, which is an AH Fox with a three inch chamber, and it was choked full and full, and it was it was obviously a waterfowl gun, and it walks into the shop and Jim looks at it and is suspicious of what this might be, and he goes back to his office and his records while the guy's out front hanging around. And he comes back and he tells this guy, uh, he asked this guy, he tried to play a little, you know, game. He said, uh, so would you be willing to sell this gun? And the guy said, maybe. And uh, Jim offered out, I'll, I'll leave some of the article, but Jim offered him a price. And once the guy saw or realized what he had, he said, no, I think you should just repair that stock. 
I'll, uh, I'll be back for it. Uh, I'll be back for it later. So he did. So Jim repaired the stock and the guy came back for it later. The guy was from Savannah, Georgia. And, um, the gun eventually did go up for auction and, and you can look all of this up. Um, most of it's common mm -hmm. knowledge by now it's been covered pretty well, mm -hmm. but it's still, you know, to hear Jim just tell the story was really fascinating. His, cause I, no, I hadn't, I had not heard his side of it and I didn't want to, I don't want to give that away. It's in the piece mm -hmm. exactly how it went down. That's awesome. But uh, if you want to know how much the gun sold for at auction, you can easily find it on Google, and it's also in the piece. And also, if you want to watch a video of, uh, of that gun being used on a duck hunt, you could go on YouTube, and it's got uh, Rogers Hoyt, who's the past uh, DU's past president at now, but he was president back then. And they're duck hunting in Beaver Dam, which is where Nash Buckingham uh, hunted. And that was, so Bo Whoop is Nash Buckingham's Super Fox. Mm -hmm. And it was a special Super Fox that was made for Nash by A.H. Fox. Burt Becker did the boring on it. And it was named Bo Whoop because of the two-tone uh, sound that it made after being fired. A boom, boom. Mm -hmm. So that's why the name of the gun is Bo Woo. At a distance, it sounds like Bo Woo. Sure. So yeah, that's I mean, that's how the gun got its name, and uh, and that's that that's that it, to have a gun like that walk through Jim's shop. Jim just couldn't believe it. He said, "I just I can't believe this gun had been missing." So this gun had before it walked into Jim's shop, it had been missing for seventy years. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that that's that was pretty pretty miraculous that it found his way to Darlington, South Carolina. Yeah. Gun it, 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 I think people are really going to enjoy reading about it in in the magazine. Just just the the history behind it, the fact that it, it was you know Nash's gun that had been written about many 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 years ago and then worked on by Jim at the Darlington shop. It just ties everything all together. And now, I mean that gun is, is with Ducks Unlimited and people will be able to see it forever and ever and ever. You know, there's not a yep. lot of stories like that tied to classic guns. And it's just, it's always fun to hear those, those kind of stories. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, whenever I get a chance, I try to, I, I, you know, I, I, I like going to Memphis to, to check out that uh, my alma mater is the university of Mississippi, which isn't far from Memphis. And it's, really cool to go there and check out that old museum so um what what's your what's the favorite story that you've written for cubby rise to date my favorite story to date for cubby rise uh i love them all uh <laughs> uh i really enjoyed writing the primlin piece okay that was a lot of fun but also a piece that's coming out uh, that's coming out really soon. Uh, it was a combination of a hunting and chef piece. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I should give any spoilers. Probably yeah. not. No, no. Like, yeah, oh. let's, let's, I'll ask you about that one. Um, it's a feature, a chef feature about uh, David Gloss. Yes. Um, from Maryland, right? Yeah. And uh, you got to go hunting with David. Um, that's tell, right. Tell us a little bit about set the set the scene for that story right so uh david is a chef that's based out of washington dc but he hunts on the eastern shore of maryland so uh and i had the privilege of uh going up there and hunting with him uh by uh, the magazine sent us up there and it was just it, it wasn't the, the you know there weren't there wasn't a lodge there wasn't it was just david and and the photographer Will Hereford and myself and his son, and it just reminded. I mean, I think one of the mo the, the greatest things is is being. I was we were out there and it was all like the four of us were just buddies. I I, I mean I'd I'd known Will before from working with him, but uh, but you know just to to uh to have that kind of synergy and dynamic just immediately. We were all just like old friends, just awesome. like so. It was it was it was really kind of surreal to, to, 
not having to have, to go from never having met this man or his family <laughs> to we were just fast friends. And I hope that the article conveys that, um, you know, a duck blind is an interesting place. It's a very confined spot. And so you get to know people really intimately because uh, there's also some danger there. You have to trust. There's a trust factor there that you're not going to take your swing, your weapon too far in either direction and accidentally shoot someone, which would be the worst thing that could ever happen. Uh, but also, um, so there's a trust factor there with the physical hunt, but there's also a trust factor in that people open themselves up and they start joking and talking and sharing stories. And, and that was really, I, I felt like I really, really got to know David mm -hmm. and that, you know, and I, you know, shared with, with him too. We all just really had a good time in that duck blind and, and, um, mm -hmm. He made some food after the hunt too. Oh, like, God. How, did we ever, how was uh, it? <laughs> the food was phenomenal. It was <laughs> unlike. I mean, it 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 didn't. It, the game the gaminess was was not uh, subdued. It was subdued. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, eliminated. It wasn't like trying to choke down something that's been soaking in vinegar. Mm -hmm. It was just delicious david knows how to make wild game delicious mm -hmm. and it was and, and so is there some other chefs that i've had the privilege to meet and interview yeah. through the magazine but yeah I, david is david that was a fun one yeah that was a and the and recipes from the dishes that he made when you guys were there are all going to be accompanying the uh the story and it's that's coming out in the next issue august september okay. so yeah we're really sure. excited about that one but i want to ask you one more question about that trip it um I, something resonated from that story for me it was and there wasn't a lot about it in there but it was captured both in your words and also in will's photography but it was sort of um David's sense and appreciation for passing on traditions to his son, who is also on the hunt. Um, did, is that something that you noticed when you were hunting with those guys? Absolutely. Absolutely. They have, they have a father son dynamic, much like I have with my father. And my father was not a hunter, but he, I see more of myself in him every day. And, you know, David, David, definitely definitely you know the love between those two between that father and son is just it, it was a great dynamic they they picked and they joked with each other um it was it was it was awesome it was yeah i i didn't i didn't i i wanted to i wanted to make sure that it got in there so i definitely wrote about it but yeah the, having david um having David's son there and then seeing him interact with him was just so warming and great. And the passing on of the outdoor traditions and the importance that David, because David realizes, you know, sporting life, sporting life is, uh, if, if we don't, if we don't pass it on, um, it will go away. And, and he makes sure that he has, uh, He's, he's make sure that his son, he and his son share those moments together a field and that, uh, it, cause Kemp doesn't go hunting. Kemp doesn't even enjoy hunting with too many of his buddies. He doesn't hunt. He doesn't hunt as much with his buddies as he does with his dad, because that's like their thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and David is cognizant of, of the importance of passing it down to that next generation. Well, like his, like his father did for him. Mm -hmm. So no, that was, that was something that, that was very evident and very touching. And it's, it's good for, you know, the R3s, mm -hmm. recruit, retain, and uh, I forgot the other R. <laughs> Reactivation. Reactivation. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I was the reactivator. <laughs> After the decade of the 80s, right. yeah. yeah. I was like, what's the other R? Yeah. I need to yeah. memorize that better. Yeah, that's, that's all good stuff. I mean, it, those are great messages and, and something that – it that I think Cubby Rise does a good job at capturing the, those types of traditions and keeping in mind how 
how necessary it is to make sure that those traditions are, uh, that they continue into the future. That's so important. Um, I hate to do it, but I think I'm going to cut us off. You know what? I think we could talk about writing and hunting and bird dogs and everything for, for hours on end, but, uh, but, but I'm going to wrap it up. So if anybody has any questions for you or for uh, any questions about any of your stories or about writing in general, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, probably through email. Um, just, uh, I have a Gmail account, uh, Oliver Hartner at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, I also have a website, uh, Oliver You can email me there. You can either email me directly or you can, I have a little contact information. You know, you can contact me via my website. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, either way it'd be great. In social media at all. Yes, I have an Instagram. Uh, I, I do a little bit of Facebooking, but I'm mostly an Instagram guy because uh, I can avoid a lot of the vitriol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like just I just like the pictures. I like to be happy. I yeah. just want everybody happy. <laughs> and what what's your handle on Instagram? Oh, it's just Oliver at Oliver Hartner. Just Perfect. my name put together. Yeah. Perfect. All right, Oliver. Thanks for all the good work, and uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, thanks for everything. And, uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate right. it. Take care. All right.